Hey everybody, thanks for joining the podcast. This is a podcast with Mike Rader. Mike Rader is a mixed media artist and filmmaker. This podcast is best enjoyed in its visual form on YouTube because we do have a bit of a slideshow. We have uh, video clips. Um, if you're listening in audio, um, I'm, I'm going to edit this in a way where it's still uh, uh, digestible. But um, this particular episode is best digested in visual form if you're interested in seeing some of the works that we're talking about. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll try to describe some of the visuals and you'll also hear the audio of some of the clips that we show. We'll keep those intact for you. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know because I know that there is a, a big portion of the audience that does listen to this podcast in audio form only. Uh, and so here's my episode with Mike Rader. All right, let me turn up my brightness here. So look at my doggy behind me. Yeah, what's his oh, name? Bennigan. 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 That's so dope. I, lo- I hope he's there the whole time. And that would be great. I don't know if he has that kind of attention span, but we'll see how it goes. What's going on with your podcast first, Eric? Yeah, sure. Um, so I started this thing. I tried starting this thing a few years ago, but I couldn't find a place to host it that uh, was basically free. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I found this service called Anchor that um, they host it for you. They find sponsors for you. Um, they'll also pay you to like promote the service oh, nice. uh, at the top of your podcast. Uh, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And it's, it's, it's a really good management tool for podcasting. And so I kind of took my back catalog that I initially started a few years ago and I put those up first. And then um, I also did a bunch of solo ones just to see if I still wanted to do it. And I really like it. I think it's a good extension of the videos I was doing back when we met. Yeah. Um, which I, I was going to talk about in the intro. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, I like talking to artists, as you know, and I like uh, yeah. having conversations that that can be put out there. I mean, for plug other in people. my other microphone. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, for other people to digest and uh, it's just seem like the obvious migration. You're certainly good at it, and I, you're certainly a super fast editor. I don't know if I've ever known anyone <laughs> edit that quick as you. Well, well the, you know, it's interesting. Is Bar- Barney Oldfield from New Filmmakers was. Hmm. Um, I had run into Bill, who who was also at New Filmmakers, uh, a few months before the pandemic, and he was saying that Barney had talked about how I was the fastest editor he had met, and I'm just like, oh, because uh, right now I don't feel like it. I feel like I've been editing my current project for too many months at this point, and yeah. uh, I You're think too I, close to it, maybe. Yeah, well, you know, I took a break. Like we shot it in July, and I didn't touch it until late September. And then I just wow. dra- dragged my heels on it. Yeah, I, I don't know why I, I took my time. I guess because I knew I wasn't going anywhere or something. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm almost done. It? I'm like three scenes away from the end of the fr- end now. So, like, Uh-oh. I do it in stages. So, right now I'm on the first pass assembly where I just kind of throw it all together the way the script says. So, I'm three scenes from the end of that. And yeah. then I got to go back and, and, and based on like kind of watching it, I'll refine it and remove things. And it's going to be like, I think the first pass is going to be over three hours. Oh, so wow. I got to figure out how to chop an hour off of it. Yeah. But, is it scary now that you're getting close to finishing shooting? Because, you know, the realness comes in. Of... Uh, you know. No. <laughs> right. Good to hear. Good to hear. So, um, do you want to start? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Go for it. Cool. I might use a little bit of that, but uh, so everybody, welcome to the podcast. I have a very special guest today, artist Mike Rader. Uh, so back in 2012, I attended the Art of Brooklyn Film Festival as a guest supporting another filmmaker and I was walking through the movie poster gallery and 
it, it, most of it was your typical what you would see in terms of a movie poster. Uh, but except for this one huge poster at the very end of the gallery, <laughs> which was done on canvas and hand painted. And I'm like, I want to meet that filmmaker. I want to see that filmmaker's movie because to, to paint your own movie poster specifically for a film festival <laughs> was totally badass. I'd never heard of it before. And I was still in the early stages of kind of networking and putting together a sort of arts tr artistic tribe of, of sorts. And that's, that's when I met Mike Rader. And uh, from then on, uh, we've, attended a couple of film festivals together. We attended New Filmmakers and the Manhattan Film Festival. You did some animations for the bumpers. Yeah, you put me in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was totally just like looking for w ways to get more of your work out there because I, I really love your style. And, you know, if I honestly think that the last two projects that I made wouldn't have really been achieved had I not honestly looked at your work and been inspired oh this guy's thinking outside the box i'm not thinking this way maybe i should think more this way and so like i got this film death in life i did i'm currently working on fractals none of those would have been possible had we not met i'm i'm fucking sure of it uh and because i wasn't thinking about working in mixed media for a long time like i had a very film school closed-minded way of thinking about movies and uh so that's that's the beginning of how I met Mike. Uh, you've done a lot since. I'm looking at your resume right now, actually. <laughs> uh, remember, remember me, Eric, when you're standing up there at the platform. <laughs> I should I should say the uh, <laughs> I should say that to you. <laughs> uh, and you currently got this uh, prosthesis uh, exhibit going on. It's a digital exhibit. It's you, true. It was moved to online because of yeah. uh, you know, COVID reasons. Is the artwork still there? It is. I believe it's going to be extended for another week, so it's up till January third. But I think it will be pushed another week uh, forward. So yeah, seven this stuff, plus three, so maybe January tenth. Really good. To. I'm going to put a link in the description for everybody uh, to go and visit this, as well as uh, your website and um, your Vimeo. You have a good selection of videos on Vimeo. I want to show you this. These are uh, so. For the festivals I used to volunteer with, when it, when they were willing to, I kept, if they were willing to let me do this, I would keep this collection of videos from the festival. So this is all these various work from some of the filmmakers that went through about four different festivals. This is um, the one with your, your movie, Man vs. Ultraman. Yeah. That's your screener. And, uh, oh, yeah, and I put it next to Maya Darren. <laughs> Quite good company. <laughs> yeah. And the one that you gave me the last time we connected. Oh, uh, yeah, Frass. yeah. So I thought you'd be interested in seeing that you're in my collection of movies that I took from festivals I used to volunteer for. I am for. honored. <laughs> um, so... How you been holding up during the pandemic? What's been going on? Um, well, we, yeah, I was teaching at the time and it got really intense there in New York and then the schools all shut down and I have a cabin out in the woods here in Pennsylvania. So we fled at the time, not thinking, grabbing our supplies, grabbing, you know, everything we could and filling a car and fled out here not knowing the duration was going to be that's for sure um so for the first i'm almost two months uh i did a lot of fretting i gotta mm. say it was hard to focus hard to be creative i did these sort of robe crazy robe pieces because i found myself in my robe like uh 20 hours a day for the yeah the, the blue one i love that robe <laughs> <laughs> that's become so a staple it, I thought I would, you know, use that as a creative outlet because it was uh, it was getting me through for the first point. And since then, we made a few, you know, gone back to Brooklyn. But now we're back still here. Um, in the meantime, I, I've made some artwork through it, but it's been not easy to focus. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that show that you mentioned is kind of about 
quarantine. There's a lot of reference to mask wearing. There's a lot of masks in the show, and these paintings that I made for the for the uh, show were like a calendar. They were I would work on it every day, and then put the date beside it, and then the unfortunate fatality total, the U.S. fatality total, was also worked into the painting. So it was sort of this log that it was a way to sort of process the news that was just getting slapping us in the face all the time, the political news and the quarantine news. So it was a way for me to sort of process it and get it out. Um, were you I, already making this work uh, before you were invited or were you invited and then? Not the paintings. The paintings were all new uh, for this. But this work I was working on, yeah, before this. Hmm. Uh, some like portrait series that kind of started out of teaching. You know, the idea of the nose goes here and how what you can do with if when you change the shape or what happens when you take an eye out and you put in a lemon when you change the scale. So it was all sort of about teaching, painting and drawing class. It started out with these crazy mustaches that I was drawing on myself for to show balance and asymmetrical balance, then moved into these stocking portraits that were about sculpture and then sort of moved into these what I started calling MR potato head portraits, which were sort of a throwback to Mr. Potato Head, maybe my first foray into sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a way of sort of really painting and sculpting the face. And since I'm always around, I happen to be the model all the time for these things. Um, and that sort of after the quarantine broke out and COVID, I started seeing these like we saw many things through a different lens. You know, because we're all putting on these masks every day to go out. And I started seeing them differently. And then that started being coupled with these paintings I was working on. And that formed the latest show that um, that you spoke about. When was the last time you were in the city? Uh, not long ago. Not long ago. Maybe three weeks, something like that. Do you bling out your mask as an artist? I don't. I don't. Oh, you don't. No, me neither. I don't. Do you? <laughs> no. Uh, I want to be. I, I want to blend in, Eric. Yeah, to be honest. me too. I don't. I don't want to be noticed. So uh, you still, you still have a studio in Brooklyn. I do. Cool. I do. I'm setting it up. Uh, it's mostly turned to a film set now for my next film project. Yeah, you were saying how like you have to be the model now because of quarantine, but I think you you enjoy it because you were always the model before. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> All this. Went uh, down. Some of it is I'm there. Uh, and I, I, I can't pay actors, you know, and then yeah. if you get volunteers, are they always going to show up? <laughs> Everyone can be enthusiastic at the beginning. I started doing these yeah. portraits for a while back and then that enthusiasm sort of wanes and you have to, so, um, this next project I would like to do work with a couple other people, but I think it's just going to work out best if I go for it again. Yeah, that's uh, it's always tough keep, keeping people inspired. Um, mm. I went through that with Fractals. I actually did, we initially started shooting the thing last winter and spring. Right. Then we got shut down. And when I wanted to go back again over the summer, uh, everybody was just done. They checked out. And yeah. um, I found that for a production to stay kind of on schedule without dropouts, you kind of have to go to younger people who don't have a lot of experience. Maybe their bills are paid by their parents or something, uh, unfortunately. And so I kind of recasted using college age kids. Yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah. You started. You you went and started over again. Yep. All wow. everything got reshot. Um, didn't have the same vibe I was going for. I was going for kind of a deciduous sort of spring look where it was just kind of cold. And now it's a summer movie. <laughs> with Are you still people. using that same prop that you that I saw a little bit of? Which the one? The black is that? hole and the. Oh yeah, that's a main set piece. So um, that's fantastic. Yeah, basically, I I, I tried finding. Uh, ways to show boring typical life stuff differently and so one of the things the character does is he applies for jobs and i said all right what's this applying for work mean to me for me it means just putting your pieces of your soul into a black hole and not hearing back 
And so uh, that's kind of what happens. Uh, but over the course of the film, it sort of becomes sentient and kind of grows like a cancer throughout his space. And oh, that's nice. that's kind of the imagery that you saw. Yeah. Oh, my next piece has some things in common with that, but we'll speak about it another time, maybe. Maybe maybe on the next one, when you're done with it and you have a, a showing, we can do an episode talking about that. That'd be great. I think it might be a while. That's okay. I mean, the last the last in person show I saw of yours was below sea level in twenty twelve. Right, so. right. That's when we met. Yeah. I, I do have images queued up. I didn't know what you had planned for today. If you do, you want to show me some stuff? If uh, well, since you brought that up. Well, the thing I, is, is these are very improvised. There's no structure. That's the beauty of it. And you can do whatever you want. Go as long as you want. It's up to you. It's the guests. Uh, it's the guests' medium. I just host it. Right. Well, I, I come. I come prepared. I come with props. Nice. You don't want to go. Without, I don't want to go without props and have nothing to say. I wouldn't now, expect English, anything English is, less. <laughs> English is my uh, my second language. Yeah. Your first is visuals. Pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Pictures. So, I got to stick with that. Um. Could we? You want to share uh, at bat? We'll, we'll start back when. Uh, let me cue this up. Like when we met. Tell me if we're good, and you can see all that. Yeah, that looks familiar. That looks and like the me, man versus Ultraman set. It is, and let me yeah. let me see if I can blow this up so it doesn't have the little things on the side, and you can still see it. Fine. Can you see that? Fine. Yeah. Perfect. Were you over the studio when this was up? I can't remember. Uh, I think I came in after you. Still, you were still uh, working on below sea level just prior to wow. bringing it over to Manhattan. Uh, but you showed me some of the props uh, that were kind of put off to the side. Yeah, right. I wish it were over for when it was up. It was fun. Uh, yeah. So this is when we met. This I started doing these hanging paintings uh, maybe four or five years before that sort of a painting that you can walk through, hang, walk around. Um, and it was the main, main painting that the uh, character was going through in the film that, that we met on uh, the Brooklyn Film Festival. And the, the artist was trying to make this portrait here of this Japanese TV character called Ultraman. Uh, that's the front, that's the back of it. And then the walls and the little mountains and there was AstroTurf. This is in my studio in Brooklyn. That was all sort of put together. So everything sort of cleared out to the side and I built this set, which was, you know, obviously it was so much fun. To make. You know, what, is, what, are, what are the materials you're using here? Uh, well, for the painting, it's just, you're, it's just like a typical painting that goes back how long. It's stretchers, uh, linen, paint. In this case, it's acrylic and oil paint. And then the bottom is chicken wire, flat newspaper, you know, Elmer's glue, that sort of thing. But I, I like that DIY look. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Godzilla films and all that, where, it, where you can sort of see the work, but yet your mind at times gets flipped into these different realities where if it's believable enough and the and the actors sort of are good and believe it, and everyone buys in, all that stuff sort of gets into this real strange territory in between reality and sort of fiction. And that's sort of where I like to exist in these film things. Uh, but that's where that was the show that you're talking about. Yeah, that was, that was upstairs, right? That was the upstairs, yeah. Yeah. Um, and these are some props for the film. And this was the downstairs. That's a that's the uh, that's a close up of that piece. Yeah. That you talked about below sea level. And this whole thing folds up and fits into a four foot by eight foot folder. Yeah. And so for everybody who's been tracking the fractals, this is the piece that inspired the ultimate version of the black hole, right here. Uh, I mean, it really. I mean, yours looks very organic, and it does look like it might grow underneath the sea or something. <laughs> but uh, it, 
this is what really got me thinking outside the box because I'm like, wow, this is – and the, the photo doesn't do it justice. Like you can stand in this and that's the true experience of it, just standing in it. Right. It came out about 25 feet on the floor. Yeah. Um, and this was the downstairs and like you mentioned, this – oh, this is the other way – was the upstairs. So the way I envisioned it, this was sort of the head and then this was the belly of the the building in a way when you sort of walked into this exhibition. Um, and then I'll take you through a few other hanging paintings while, while I got the, these paintings up. Sure. I know we're maybe here to talk about film, but I was a printmaker and painter first. Um, and I got turned on to, this is uh, an effigy to Lou Reed after Lou Reed died. I made this piece at Long Island University. Uh, that's Lou. I, both of those are Lou. Ascending and descending. You want go back. So the black is descending. It, it flip flops depending oh, on <laughs> your perception. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he, yeah. He was one of those guys I met at New Filmmakers. Actually, I'm not sure if you did. That. Yeah, he was he cordial? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I've never heard anyone say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't That's want to meet okay. heroes, I guess. No, I never. No, I stopped trying to meet my heroes a long time ago. Um, uh, but with his music and his writing, I believe him and along with us, a handful of other people helped raise me in my second phase of growth. Yeah, I mean, he had a, he had an important role in the history of art. Uh, especially music and um, his affiliation with Andy Warhol and all that. Um, there's no doubt about that. I wrote a, a note to him, Eric, uh, the show that you saw, and thanked him because I listened to a lot of his music while I was making that show, and and I threw the the letter in the garbage. I never mailed it, and he ended up dying like two weeks later. So. This is my my new letter. This piece. Uh, this was this is the back of this piece that I made at an artist residency, Tawatan Artist Residency in China. Um, this was supposed to be permanently installed, but I think they had to take the building down now. I'm not sure. It still might be there. Um, mm -hmm. But I made it in a couple of weeks when I was there. It's just sort of working furiously. That's the front. That's the sort of back of it. It had these dog tongues. My dog passed away when I was there. Um, so it's sort of, it was about my experience there, the, whole, the, to, the totality of it, being present, not being present, my dog passing away, uh, this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and then the straps, you could see it hangs, what must have gone up about 15 feet. It hangs all the way up to the ceiling and just kind of, just barely hangs about two inches above the ground. It kind of hovers there. What's this, um, this fuzz? Yeah. Those are brooms. Um, well, this oh. is kind of a funny story that, you know, the person, Gordon, this great guy who runs the residence, he said you can use whatever you want, you know, art supplies, had a big art supply closet. And they had these brooms in there. Um, so I played around with them a little bit, painted with them just for fun. But then I liked the way they sort of looked um, sculpturally in here. And I liked this idea of cleaning up. I was sort of cleaning out my head at the time. So I put them in there and when I would come in in the morning, because this was hanging for a while before I left, the brooms were always moved around and I couldn't figure out what was going on. It turned out the cleaning people were still using them. They were taking them out of the painting, cleaning up and putting them back in it. Um, so I ended up calling the piece broom holder. <laughs> that's what, that's what, big glorified broom holder at this point. It's still that's really funny. That's, that's uh, funny. And then I'll take you through just so we get familiar with the paintings. This was um, from that film where I pushed that boat across campus. I don't know if you saw uh, that piece. Uh, this was sort of the end result painting. There's a, there's, there's a, there's a, can you go back? Yeah. There's this um, part towards in the middle, towards the left, uh, where it looks like a person is bending over. Do you see that? Where the rock is hanging there? Yeah. Yeah. About where, yeah, it looks like somebody's bending over. I could see that. I could see yeah. that. Um, this was sort of called, I can't remember what I called, Between Two Rivers. It, I, I went back to an alma mater and they, they allowed me to <clears throat> do whatever I want. Well, that's not true. I have a, 
have a show there. First they said you could do whatever I want. So then I pitched them an idea and they said, oh, you can't, you can't do that. And then I <laughs> pitched them a second idea and they said, yeah, I can't do that. So I ended up doing this, um, which is I pushed this boat from my dorm across campus uh, to the gallery and then sort of made a painting about the experience. You can see the, the, the film for the piece going on in the background there. What what were the ideas they rejected? Out of curiosity, uh, they were they were because they said you could do whatever you want. They were ridiculous ideas. I knew they wouldn't be accepted, but I just thought I'd have fun with that idea. I could do whatever. One was pack the um, the design building in clay, for, like as a giant pyramid. So I needed like forty thousand pounds of clay. I request, <laughs> and then I wanted to um, build. And that's what got me to this piece. Then I asked to build this. Um, 30 foot sailboat inside this 30 foot lake that they have. So you, it wouldn't move. It would just be take up the entire lake. Um, yeah, that was, then I knew that wasn't going to happen. First of all, I knew I couldn't do it, but I just wanted to pitch it to see what the email was that I got back. But what's funny about it is letting my mind do that. It led to the piece about pushing the boat across campus, which was kind of this idea of mishandling a vessel, you know, which is a great way to, describe my college experience <laughs> <laughs> to say the least uh let me escape by this i think that's the last one i had from you for the painting thing all right i also queued up but we'll, we'll get to it at your you know some ultraman clips some stuff from the new show whatever you whatever you wherever direction you're going with it yeah i, I yeah i'd love to go into the ultraman clips too and you know it's not just film that you know, I know you said earlier that we, we, that oh well, this isn't film, but I want to. We need to talk about all of it. Uh, you know, today's the, the the podcast I released today was about journalism, which has nothing to do with film directly at all. And uh, I think uh, I, I've been trying to put together an episode where I talk to YouTubers who go after scammers. So we can talk about whatever. It doesn't just have to be film. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, have you ever seen those YouTube channels where, like, they actually call the scam numbers and they figure out where they are and then they pull personal information for each individual scammer? So when the scammer hacks into their computer, they see on their desktop their own picture. It's it's like they creep no. them out. Yeah, it's wonderful. And so I've been trying to get those guys on here. And so it's just like I'm branching out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to tackle all subjects and mediums and... You do always cast a wide net, eh? <laughs> yes. I want to know everything. Yeah. So uh, you, you, when you pull up the Ultraman clips, I'm interested in uh, your use of sort of pop culture imagery, uh, not necessarily from this side of the pond. <laughs> uh, how, you, how, how is some of that especially with the Ultraman. So like the, some of the audio snippets, for example. Mm. Uh, how is that inspiring you? Why did you decide to use it? And how, I'm also interested in um, whether or not your use of some of that material is the reason we don't see any of these films officially distributed. Uh, I'm trying to fi I'm trying to figure out. Like, well, you, like, you all were at the film festival when we screened it. I think you know why it's not distributed. I think that it should be though. I think <laughs> it's a beautiful piece of work, it. and I would totally like. That's, of course, I'm a I'm a rare beast. I know that, but I, I've seen films like that out there, and. Uh -huh. I think it's tragic that Man vs. Ultraman isn't out there. And I was racking my brain trying to figure out why it, why it's not accessible. And, I, and I'm wondering if it's because of the use of those audio snippets or if it's just because just didn't get around to it. I don't it. think I'm plugged into that culture. Yeah. But like for it to be seen and for the right person to, to push it. You know, I only did those festivals around the city for the most part. It, it played in a few a few other ones. But a lot of those uh, film festivals, when they have experimental categories, you, it's not that experimental. I mean, and then uh, when I went to the, the openings and the parties, if you said you were an experimental filmmaker, I mean, people, I actually had people turn their backs on me at the Manhattan Film Festival. Because like, everyone's there trying to make connections. So you're, you realize yeah. you're put in a corner right from the start. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know if that's, you know, part of it or. Maybe. Yeah. I found that that's, um, avant-garde experimental and all that isn't really respected on at certain festivals and Manhattan was definitely one of them. Um, I tried my best to make it more acceptable, but with that said, I think that there are people out there who would be interested in this, whether they even know it or not. Like I didn't know that I would be, to be honest, until I saw it. Mm. And so those are the people I want to kind of find. And, um, well, me too. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we should figure out how to get that movie available somewhere. Have you ever heard of Film Hub? No. Film Hub is where like you list your movie by putting it up there with all of the materials you would use. So you would create like sort of a poster for it. You would create all the headers and stuff depending on the platform. And they would then sell it to various platforms on your behalf. So you wouldn't even have to deal with it. I see. I don't think the audio collage is a problem because it's just snippets. I mean, it's, it has so little to do with the original script and the original audio and the, even the original show. You know, you asked why I used the audio from that and where that pop culture came from. Well, I never intended to be uh, an artist that used these pop culture references, but before the Ultraman piece, I made that Charlie Chaplin film, uh, which I went to anthology film archives and saw Chaplin's gold rush. I think, you know, the story I've told it. Maybe. And I came out of there and I thought I'm, I'm going to make paintings about every character in the film. I was just so jazzed about that film. There was no soundtrack. It was totally silent in theater, not even piano. Um, and just watching that for an hour and a half was like electrifying to me that we sat there in silence for an hour and a half and watched this man sort of uh, go through all these, all these different stages and all these different learning experiences in the film Gold Rush. It's, you know, if anyone's never saw it, it's a real masterpiece by Charlie Chaplin. But as I was making the paintings, I said, oh, this is just like the character in the film. I'm going through this same sort of Gold Rush. And then I, I bought this camera, a really cheap camera on Craigslist and made the film and then realized I, I always try to turn over every stone in a project. So I was like, oh, I, I should sort of dress like Chaplin. And then, and then it sort of started snowballing this idea of uh, appropriating popular culture, but it was never a plan I had uh, from the get go. And jumping ahead to the Ultraman piece, I think I used, I started, I watched all the Ultraman programs and whatever they said something, I'd write it down in a notebook that would relate to art making, not necessarily what was going on in the TV show. Um, so I could use it that way. And then I realized when I started making the film, I like a lot of people, I don't have voice training. I don't, I can't stand listening to myself. You know, this is teaching online with Zoom as sort of, so I had to get over a lot of that. But and I thought, oh, I could just use, cut. The, I love collage, everything. When I look back at all my years of making art, collage is always the, what underlines everything. And film, as you know, is collage. Um, and I thought oh, I could just cut up the audio and, and make my own sort of audio and collage that as well. Collage the whole, uh, everything, every aspect of it. And that's kind of why I started using the audio. And then I, it also goes back to watching these films and TV shows initially when they were dubbed. Right. Yeah. And then there were, that sort of folded its way into it. It sort of started to make sense for the piece. That's not really the reason it's not out there. I take it. <laughs> oh no, I, I don't know if that's a problem. Like that using that audio, I don't. I really yeah, I don't doubt it, but are. I don't think so. You would know more than I would. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I tend to. Um, I mean, you probably use so few of it so briefly that it wouldn't matter. But I don't really know. That's yeah, my I'm, assumption. And I made my own music because I didn't want the music to be, you know, copyright a problem either. So. How'd you do that? What was your process? I, I, I'm terrible with music. I had no idea how to do it, but I was like, you know, fuck it. I'm going to do this for fun. Like everything, you know, like, let's just go for it and see what this is like. So I had a synthesizer and, you know, I started just banging on the keyboards to try to get some sort of emotion out in certain scenes. And then through uh, programs, 
I realized, oh, you can slide these notes around. You know, and then I started learning how to play a little bit better where I can make some sort of um, music melody out of it. And then if my fingers were slipping, I could change the note, you know, in a, in a program and move things over and stretch them out until I could make uh, capable music for the piece. That's, that's what I would, <laughs> I would call it. So all the music uh, underscoring that movie is yours. Yeah, yeah, and again, it's that idea of uh, doing it yourself. I like that homemade look. Yeah. Uh, it's it's music made with chicken wire and, and plaster. And paper. <laughs> it's the same idea. DIY. Yeah, I think that that's a good um, description of the look because uh, that's a look that I think I find pretty romantic. Uh, DIY. Uh, do- there is a Japanese word I have it written down that this idea of making something out of nothing. It is its own art form. Taking as little as possible and making something out of it. I think that's why those films are seen differently there than here. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, because we would never on this side of the world think to do that. Uh <laughs> Or even have some level of cultural respect for that type of thing. Right, right. I've, I've been to the film forum when they had Godzilla film festivals. And, you know, there are, there are people that are laughing. Yeah. And there's this big divide in the, in the movie. How, you know what the film forum's like. There's some serious folks go there. And there's uh, there's this big divide about people who sort of being entertained by the in a different way almost uh almost um i wouldn't say looking down on it but maybe maybe yeah i mean there's definitely a a passive judgment that uh isn't in the spirit that i would want uh and i see that too with a lot of uh no budget indie film where like it's not so bad that it's good type of thing but like it's perceived that way whereas i you, know, you could be laughing at something because maybe the acting isn't there or maybe the sets aren't there. Or maybe the storytelling was a little shoddy and it's perceived as funny. Um, I, I've all, like, I don't know. Have you ever seen that movie, The Room? No. They made the disaster artists uh, about the making of this movie, The Room, which was one of those movies where it, it was perceived as so bad that it's really funny. I see. And so, but they reality of the production was he was trying really hard to make a drama Mm. and he just kind of got all of the signals crossed and it just became this cult midnight hit but so people could laugh at it and throw forks at the screen and things like that Mm. Uh, and i've always just kind of viewed it as just like a pretty valiant attempt at trying to make a film that's along the lines of what this person enjoyed you know, he enjoyed drama, but uh, he d- he wasn't mentored in a way to be able to achieve it. And so he came up with this thing. And uh, now it's it's kind of a, a thing people make fun of. Uh, but, um, yeah, I'm not surprised that people go to laugh at Godzilla. I think that those are, are wonderfully artistically created movies. I, it's... The, the sets sometimes, I just marvel at the sets. It's amazing. It's a really great artist built a lot of those sets. And that's sometimes what I got the most somet- out of it, you know. I, I think mean, we're also used to here looking at, you know, multi-million dollar movies. Yeah. It, you, you ever see, um, there's a movie done in the last few years with Anne Hathaway where she... I did see it. You did see it, yeah. yeah. And... Um, the filmmaker initially wanted to do it the old fashioned way under the condition that he got to be in this monster suit, but this, <laughs> the studio turned him down. They're like, no, you got to do it digitally. <laughs> uh, I knew, yeah, I knew you're going like any sort of monster movie like that. I'm, I'm in yeah. for better or worse. I'm going for it. So when you were going to these film festivals uh, with, Man versus Ultraman. Were there reactions that you were getting that you didn't think you'd get? I, I didn't. I no, because I had no preconceived notion of that. Really, I mean, I it was people really loved the film. Like I met you know you from it and a lot of different uh, filmmakers and artists. And then there were 
there were people that <laughs> walked out. <laughs> you know, they just weren't weren't sure what they were looking at. I mean, we I think we witnessed that together. You know. Yeah, I love the walkout. Um, so, uh, what? How would you compare your experience at a film festival versus your experience opening in a gallery? Because now that you have experience with both. It's different because people, uh, when they come to the gallery, uh, have certain expectations. So it plays to that audience that, you know, that there's nothing sort of new to them in a way. In the in the film festival, you know, people were only walking out because I was paired with um, an earnest sort of science fiction film or something like that. Mm. And then they watched that and then mine rolled after that. Um, so the audience wasn't really, um, it's so out of context in a way. And I've had this as a problem and like what I make sort of falls between the film festival and sometimes the gallery world. Um, because humor isn't always accepted at a lot of galleries. I've had a little trouble with it. I'm not the first artist to that, you know, to be serious art. Uh, but uh, I use humor to get to higher, you know, thought, hopefully. But I do have, I do sort of fall in between those two worlds. And it's, I've had a little bit of struggle sort of navigating that space in between. Like who, who wants to see that? Where is that platform? I'm not totally sure. Yeah, I hadn't thought much about humor in the art world and it's a lack of acceptance, but it makes total sense because in film, it, the, you know, the big thing is if you want to win best picture, don't make a comedy. Ah, see. <laughs> you know? Really? I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why. Uh, I guess just humor is too divisive. I don't know. It's what separates us from the animals, right? Bill, you know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do Do you want to uh, pull up these clips? Let me let me sh let me show a, a clip of that. Let me share. I usually have two that I two of the same ones when I trot out. Um, to set this up, the character that I made for myself out of, uh, was sort of constructed out of pillows to go through this experience, soften any blows coming its way, um, which you're going to see. And then uh, he goes to the see this prophet to give him advice and then has to make a decision to split from that in a way. Um, and there, there's humor in it also, and then but it's serious also. Um, I had a lot of fun with this scene. I built these models that would, have, would only appear in the film for seconds just so I could step on them. This miniature room that's probably only in the film for a second that uh, you'll see pass by and then had a lot of fun with the sound effects. And you also hear this, my attempt at making music in this clip. Let me share it with you. Are you here for you, or for the painting? I'm not sure about it. Then why come here now? To increase the chances of certainty. But you've made the work so far. That's right. Created with these two hands. The work of a genius. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> Find out the truth. <laughs> 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 
doing I'm doing I'm doing I'm doing I'm doing I'm doing I'm doing <laughs> A couple right. of things when I look at that uh, is that one is I didn't know you could buy until then uh, flash pots online. Like none of that is After Effects. I bought a little flash pot for the explosion, huh. um, which I had a trigger in my finger. So when you step on it, you could set off the uh, little explosion there in the studio. That's, that's better than After Effects, though. Oh yeah, it was a dream come true. Like, well, <laughs> I'll probably be picking your brain about a lot of it. As I haven't watched that movie in in a while, and now I kind of want to rewatch it after that. Because uh, I just love the the yeah. I, I know they're packing peanuts, but the violence of you slitting it open and having the packing peanuts come out. Yeah, it's just like I know what it is, but at the same time, there's an effect to it. Yeah, I've had I had once or twice someone asked me if I was a violent person uh, when. <laughs> And now I look with a lot of things I show, I'm like, oh, I, I, I guess I see where that's coming from. But a lot of it's to myself. It's just these, oh, oh kitty. It's yeah, just. It's, uh, <laughs> that's kitty. Oh, adorable. Yeah. It's just this sort of uh, self, self journey, self criticism that I'm um, putting myself through that nobody's, no, uh, no packing peanuts are being harmed in the making of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be reused it, for sure. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is that's sort of an, a stab at abstract expressionism, the macho-ness of it all, um, when he has that big sort of painting wad he's using as a big brush between coming from between my legs. It's sort of a, it's like my know, brush is bigger you know. than yours. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> what well, did you build the, um, it looked like a, like a little factory or some kind of brick building. You built that? I did. I got a, like a HO train set factory and then modded it out to look like the building that we lived in the studio that we lived in um, with the giant so i sort of i sort of uh frankenstein a couple models together to make that pain in it it was great i had to get it in one shot you know you got to step on it twice i had to get that flash pot right <laughs> no no it looked good it looked <laughs> Thanks. i uh, i forgot all about that sequence um it's been probably three years since i stuck that in when was that uh, festival? When did we? What year was that? We met. Uh, that was 2012. That was Art of Brooklyn, and then eight years ago, probably 20. I want to say late 2012, early 2013 for the new filmmakers thing. But I'm uh, looking it at your like, resume. It was like 15 years. Yeah. Oh no, we did. So Art of Brooklyn and New Filmmakers was both in 2012, and then. Uh, Art of, you went to the Art of Brooklyn again in 2013, and then after that, you went to the Manhattan Film Festival, so that was the same year. Mm. Uh, interesting. Yeah, you have you have a, all, the, all the stuff on your resume uh, that's on your website. I got to update it. I haven't updated it in a little bit. So, um, remember that, that filmmaker profile video I did for you? Yeah, that was when, like you shot it and edited it and sent it to me in the morning. That was amazing. That's, that's yeah, why I said yeah. I've never seen anyone edit so quick. Uh, well, you say something in there that, well, I was turning those things out quickly because I was doing them for free and I wanted to get them over with. But um, you say something in there which stuck with me, and I've kind of written about this idea more and more since then. And that's, you say, I think. And then I'm going to probably not do your quote justice, but it was something along the lines of, um, you took art classes as a child and then by a certain grade, they cut you off. And the way you say it, I'm like, oh, wow, that's cutting somebody off from art is a violent act. Uh, and I, I just kind of the delivery of that stuck with me. I'm like, oh. So, so what happened in the years since is, I've always seen the the cutting of funding for the arts in school as a violent act towards mm. the citizenry, uh, and so 
I'm going to, I'm going to probably put a link to that video. Cause I think it's a great interview, uh, for the most part. And it has a lot more clips in it, uh, of that film, but I want to, if it's okay with you, direct this a little bit towards talking about art education and the importance of funding for art education. Okay. And we can also talk about your education. It looks like you went to Bowling Green University. I did. Edinburgh I met Sherry there. Uh, and Art Institute of Pittsburgh. And so we could talk about all that as well. Art Let's Institute see. of Pittsburgh, I got some sort of scholarship to cut out of high school and go down there for the day once a week, I think. And that was like my school. How many weeks? Uh, might have been my senior year, my junior year. So yeah, I get to go to downtown Pittsburgh and go to the Art Institute for the day. Uh, maybe every other week. I can't totally remember. But the truth is, I never went. Like we just went, we just went downtown and blew it off and kicked <laughs> around town for the month. I rarely <laughs> went. I rarely went. What? What? That, that that is a big pattern throughout most of my education. That's okay. Uh, you know, you're an outside the box artist. Um, Edinburgh. Yeah. Yeah, when I was a freshman, it was voted the number one party school in America. I don't know if that there's a coincidence. What if that's what enticed me there? I didn't want to go to college. My parents were like going to college. Do you study art there? <clears throat> yeah, I studied art there. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know what I studied, but I went there for art. So, um, when you're you when you're going to, for your bachelor's or your master's in art. How how much of those of the degree plan as actually focused on art and versus not, and also what sort of capstone project, if any, were you, you expected to do in terms of? Uh, as an undergrad, you had to get. Um, it was a college situation, so it was. I still had to take my psychology and my science, my philosophy, my math classes, all of that. So art would have been, uh, yeah, I don't know if it was a 50-50 split, but, uh, and 50-50 is about, yeah, I, I'd say. But in graduate school, you sort of were allowed the first year to just find your way, and by the second year, you were working towards uh, your final show. And I was a printmaker there for both yeah, graduate and undergraduate, which I haven't really made much since. I think that was a way of me getting past it all. I started out in graphic design. I took so a two-year graphic arts course. So we were doing um, – but back then it was pa Adobe PageMaker. So we would create – sort of the template and then we'd have to take it to a dark room photograph it onto a piece of film and then used that film to make an offset plate and we put it on the offset press and we yeah i mean it was huge huge process um so we would do have like you know the developer the stop bath and all that and, um why did you drop it I, that wasn't the way the technology was going it was sort of the for some reason, my high school was teaching the old way of doing it. And it was so clear that that was not the way the yeah. current, the presses at the time were doing it. Uh, but then also, like, if I, I've always wanted to continue working in film and, like, getting my hands wet with the chemicals and all that. But um, it's just too expensive. Like, I can't have a dark room here or anything like that. Because if I was going to do it, that's the way I would probably want to do it. Because I can't stand computers. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough, especially now. I mean, you're, we're on it so much. Look, at, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, uh, it's something that it, it, it's a chore to have to go on the computer and do anything on it at this point. I want to go into a dark room, and we had a very cool dark room where there were no doors. the The entryway curved in such a way that light couldn't bend beyond a certain point, right, so you could right. just like walk in and out of it. It, it was totally cool, and. Yeah, I, I mean, after that, I started dabbling in video, which evolved into film and all that. But I miss I miss this idea of kind of going into this. To me, the dark room was an alternate universe. So I would go into this alternate universe, create something, and then 
come out with it and like look what I, I emerge with. Is yeah, you're passing thing. through a serious threshold of light. You know? Yeah. What brought you to New York? Uh, well, I graduated from Bowling Green and had a show, a couple of shows at this place in Pittsburgh uh, and showed maybe in a group show, this fellow named Nut Vital, who en ended up being, he was really big in New York at the time and now he's a huge artist. Um, and the guy who ran the gallery said, can you drop this off? I was cutting through New York to go up into New England to visit Sherry. She was at an artist uh, residency up in Connecticut, up in Mystic, Connecticut. What you doing, puppy? Hey. And uh, he said, can you drop this off at Notes Place? And I went in. He buzzed me up to the studio. This is on Broadway, just where the, where the Strand used to be. You know, sort of down that way. Um, no, is that true? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, I went up into a studio and I saw this amazing art. It changed my life that moment, that day. Stuff like where I went to school in Bowling Green, it was a lot of figurative. It was sort of conservative art uh, for the most part. And I walked up his studio and he was doing these unbelievable sculptures. And one of them was a life-size version of the... David's testicles that were up on the wall <laughs> and they were um, in plaster and he sanded them and they were glowing white and, and they were hanging like a sculpture. And I just remember thinking, I, I got to move here. This is it. This is it. <laughs> uh, and then he said to me, you've done everything in Pittsburgh. What have you, I had already shown in the gallery and was in a group show at the Carnegie museum at the time. He said, you, you already did everything in Pittsburgh. You must move here. You must move here. And then coincidentally, when I went back from the trip, I stopped to get gas and uh, this person was a friend of my father and he said his daughter lives in New York and is looking for a roommate. I mean, all within the same week. And then I was gone in a week. I was gone. I moved to New York and then Sherry came up right right after that, after I moved up. Uh, you know, the, the, the testicle story reminds me of something from a couple of years ago when we had reconnected where there was a film you had sent me that you that you wanted to show students in your class, but you you were concerned <laughs> that you couldn't because of cancel culture, and that's yeah. just this 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 Bruce film Allen. of the finger was it the finger or something that's kind of pushing it. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, Bruce Nauman video. <laughs> yeah, I don't, too, too much of a can of worms. I don't think I'd show that now. Yeah, I. Uh, I was in my MFA when cancel culture kind of took off, and that was on the campus at Sarah Lawrence. And I remember there were a lot of um, writing professors who were becoming agitated by the responses they started getting to the required readings. Like there were people who decided that they were no longer to, no longer going to read Philip K. Dick stories because he was a known uh, misogynist, or Charles Bukowski, same, uh, and. Do you, do you feel like there's kind of an injustice going on in certain respects, especially in academia, where you can't use certain works anymore to say, hey, this is what's going on out here? Yeah, but hopefully that, that is the means to a very positive end, meaning that the pendulum switches this way and we understand certain aspects of it and it lands at a different... I think hopefully most of it is... The, um, with best intentions and in the landing spot maybe is better than where we are now with a, with a lot of things. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, it's a, a, you know, a lot of those issues raised are obviously extremely important and need, need their voices heard. So I, I'm on, I could see a, a bigger, um, I can see many sides to all of that, and, and hopefully at least the conversation's happening. I understand what, what, certainly your comment, that like, oh, a lot of this great art, is it just going to be thrown wayside? But I think what's more, more important about it is that the conversation's happening, and then maybe this stuff will be revisited just with different eyes, and or, or we understand this about that certain artist, but then they also did this. Have you, uh, have you we'll watched the goes. show? Um, uh, it's on HBO. It's called Lovecraft Country. Sure, yeah. You watch yeah. that? Yeah, you know, my, I, like, uh, I like how they integrated his his sort of uh, weaknesses as a person. 
Yeah, yeah. My neighbor up here did the production design and the, the set for it. Um, and she did an amazing job. Like the the, the backgrounds and the locations that were all they were all so on point. Um, so I was fortunate to see a lot of the early sketches of uh, of that stuff. Uh, it's a good show. Yeah, I, I really like. I think that's a good example of what you can do in terms of keeping the work alive and relevant, but also acknowledging the bad shit. So mm, right, right. turning his racism into a, one of his monsters. Mm, sure. Yeah. Yeah. See, there, well, there you go. Both, both sides can be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are you not teaching anymore? No, I'm teaching. Well, it's on, it's break right now. Oh, it's break. But you, last time we talked, you might have, I think you were being outed. Ousted. Well, it's, it's the adjunct life. It's like you, <laughs> you, it's higher, you go from station to station. You're almost like a freelancer. And I always sort of, it always works out, but I'm always like, I don't know. I finally go in again. The class I had <clears throat> this semester is at Parsons is, and I had such a great group of students. It was amazing. Really bright, really smart kids. And because of the pandemic, uh, I think they're able to sort of focus on their work because that's all they really, you know, they can't do anything else. There's the, the social life, unfortunately, is minimized to nil. So a lot of them just like poured yourself, for the most part, into their schoolwork. And you saw the results. I mean, it was... Uh, are, are you doing it through zoom pardon are you doing it through zoom yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. which is it's just got its own you know that's exhausting yeah yeah uh what i want to be a teacher right now um you do right. save on uh time and money on commuting <laughs> you know that's amazing really uh, that is a, a very small uh, thing on the plus side, but you know, the students. I'm sure they really would love to be at college, but they grew up looking and staring at a computer their whole life, so it really wasn't. I don't think it was a, as much of an issue for them as it was for the faculty. How long? Uh, how long is prosthesis up at this point? So if, if this uh, goes out Friday, how long will people have? Let me let me click on this here. Last we spoke, they talked about extending it a week, and I think it was going to come down. Let me click on the calendar. That'll help. Sure. It was going to come down on Sunday, which is the 3rd. Uh, so it'll probably then come down January 10th. Uh, but it's on their website. Uh, it's a shame it can't be seen in person. But in a way, because of the content, it, it, it's okay that it's an online show because it's kind of dealing with quarantine. What happens after a show goes down? What happens to your work? What do you do with it? I bring it all home and put it in a closet. That's it? <laughs> that's, Plex yeah, does? Most, that's for the most part. <laughs> yeah. You know, some things sell. And... Um, in this case, where there's more affordable things at, at this show, for sure, because uh, certainly I didn't think people could afford otherwise. But um, was below but, sea level ever for sale? It was for sale there. It Did it sell? No. In fact, when I when I was making it, when I pitched him the show, I asked him if he could sell it, and he said no, right off the bat. So I, you know what? I was very freeing. Because I just made whatever the hell I wanted to make. Because I knew, yeah. you know, that don't, don't want to, I, that sometimes that idea can screw you up as an artist. Like, oh, maybe this will sell. And then you start, and I always try to put that out of my mind. But knowing that he had zero ability to sell it <laughs> was very so free. What's the gallery owner's uh, or manager's ex expectation? Why are they doing it if they can't sell it? Well, I think they would like to sell certain things, but I think galleries have to also, uh, you know, they they also are following their heart too. I mean, he he was an art lover. I'm sure he had some shows that helped pay the bills. Right. 
you know, and in other shows that he's just sort of following his uh, his heart as well. So if somebody decided they wanted to buy it, what do you think you'd get for it? That below sea level? Yeah, both floors. I, I don't know. It's a giant. It's a giant painting. Yeah. That took a lot of resources and a lot. I think he was selling, trying to sell for thirty thousand um, bucks, which certainly sounds a lot, you know. But I would go higher. It comes to me, and then I pay taxes, and then my studio, you know, I'm still make. You know. I would say it, it, over a hundred thousand. Like that would be my guess. Yeah, it was a big piece. I yeah. appreciate your your price tag. Maybe if you want, <laughs> go ahead. Good luck to you. I'll split it. Well, with you. I'd like to see it somewhere permanently, <laughs> like maybe at MoMA or something. That'd be kind of cool. That would be cool. Yeah. I know. It's not just blowing smoke. I want to see I it there. It. MoMA sponsor me. Uh. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You want to see some images? Uh, let me see if I got. Yeah, I want to see everything. I assume you could chop all this down into three minutes in the end, Eric. So. Three minutes. I trust you to edit this down. Um, I try not to edit, except to oh remove. Um, like you requested, I remove something earlier. I'll definitely honor that, and I'll try to kind of keep it a flowing conversation. Because when people listen to it in audio form, uh, they're listening to it probably on a commute or something, and so it has to be ah, like so, continuous. So, uh, I guess it's not a good idea for me to show. I thought it was video form to show painting. No, no, really... no, show, show, show everything because there is a YouTube component to it. And so what I'll do for the audio version is I'll do an intro <laughs> where I'm like, hey, if you're listening to this in audio, uh, just to let you guys know there is a visual component to this. Please visit it, it on YouTube if you're interested. Otherwise, you know, they'll still get the conversational aspects. I get you. I get you. Yeah. I was initially not going to do YouTube and then... Uh, I don't know. I just kind of started doing the zooms with video rather than just because in my first zoom, I just did audio and I'm like, well, I might as well just do video, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and it gets more traction. So as much as I don't like how I look on zoom, uh, I need hits. <laughs> yeah. Who does, you know, I, I've, uh, zoomed and you could see people who have, uh, really laid it out for lighting. You're like, wow, they look amazing. You know, they really went I, for it. I've got, so I got my house lights, plus I got, I'll show you, it's my spare. I got one of these lights on me. It's an RGB uh, pocket light. That's it? That's what I have yeah. on me right now. Um, yeah. It's, I'm waiting for it to die. I'm, I haven't used these since the movie, so I'm not sure how long it'll stay on. <laughs> I'm like testing it. I've never been, I've always struggled a little bit when I start my new film with lighting. It's just, it's a little bit tricky for me. It's my least favorite part of the craft because it's the one I'm least, I like, I'm not good at lighting at all. It is, a, it, is an, it is an art form and it takes, you know, like any art form, a long time to understand and be good at it. And I appreciate it when I see it on film, you know. Was it Stanley Cortez? You know, this guy who does the lighting. He did uh, Night of the Hunter. Uh, what a master at lighting, you know. Like, and then when I'm sitting here just bending lights, like, a, <laughs> like yeah, to, uh, to using find the a, art form. To find a balance between natural and art is just, it's hard. It's the hardest thing. Yeah. I yeah, don't yeah. know how to do it. Oh. Yeah. Aww. What? What? He's a, he's only eleven months, so he kind of likes to play. You know? Yeah. Well, throughout throughout our our whole conversation, I started out with all eight cats on this side of the apartment, and then when I just went to use the restroom, they're all in in the bedroom. I'm like, how did you get through the door? And I guess I was too distracted to notice that Jan was letting them into the bedroom one at a time. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you need a time lapse of that. So, I'm so, so I don't remember where we were. Maybe you could. You had uh, more clips. We we've, we've seen one clip so far. Uh, that's the violent the violent one. <laughs> uh, you know what? Having heard you say that, maybe I won't show you the other one. Then. No, I want to say. I want to say. <laughs> um, all right. I, I I loaded up one clip from Frass. I and then 
I put in a few things from the show I got up now. All right. So yeah. everybody, we're going to be watching a clip from this movie, Frass. Uh, and what this was, what the word frass is, is what it is, um, it's, oh, thanks, Eric. it's caterpillar, that hammer we'll see in this piece, actually, that you just showed. It is caterpillar droppings, is the scientific word for frass. And the reason I chose it is, th this is sort of a bunch of little vignettes about being in the studio and dealing with uh, artist block, maybe, and or even just the paradox of making art as these little ideas, uh, a friend of mine said, why don't you just put the camera in the studio and uh, film little ideas you're thinking. It was a great idea. So it led to this, which is a series of these things that are sort of strung together. Um, uh, and a lot of them I see, again, as paradoxes that you're sort of dealing with as an artist uh, while you're trying to make things. But I'll just show you a clip of two of them that happen to deal with that hammer that you just showed. Um, the violence thing makes me think I should have chose something else to sort of soften my image now that you laid that out. Let me put no, this out. You, you can't worry about stuff like that. I'm Otherwise, not, you won't create anything. You know? I'm not worried about it. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Oh wait, let me turn that off. <laughs> that was in front of the. I re reassembled. Oh, kitty! I reassembled the painting in the studio for a bit. So that was in front of that piece that you parts of that painting that you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, what was the trick? Because it looked like it was going through your foot. Uh, I tried to spread my toes in doing that, but I will say I did put the nail through the skin of my big toe and did not know it until it was, you know, I'm not trying to act in these things. I'm trying to be in the moment, you know? So I, um, I guess I was just sort of so focusing on moving forward. 
but I didn't realize it. And as I, you know, my sock was bleeding after I took it off, but it wasn't, it was, it wasn't quite the injury that it might You're literally, sound like. literally bleeding to create art. Uh, what was it? Uh, or was it the first one or was it later on during it? That, What's that? that? That you skinned your toe. It was during that shot somewhere. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know where, um, <laughs> But it was kind of this idea of like when I, when I, the idea of not having ideas is an idea. Not so much artist block, because obviously that wasn't, didn't, that's not something I really have a problem with. But um, the idea of not having an idea as an idea, like where does that go? As a starting point, let's say. If if not having an, an idea is the idea, what are the visuals that first come to mind for not having an idea? Right. Well, that's it's exactly right. It's not. It's kind of an impossibility. But that was just the starting point. <laughs> that was just the starting point. Oh, good looking kitty. This is Juliet. Hi, Juliet. Oh, dog doesn't like it. No, Sherry's got home and he can see out. He can see out the window. Uh. <laughs> Hold on one second. Sure. Hi. Eric just yelled hi. Hi, Eric. <laughs> I love the CNBC interviews where, like, somebody's reporting on something serious, and, like, a toddler will walk into the room needing something, and it's, it's, it's really funny. <laughs> I realize my, my students in this one class I last had, um, all they really wanted to do was just see my dog. Like, <laughs> at a certain point, that was... Because they'd hear me talk about and look moving, and really that was, that's what they took from the class most was they finally got to see the dog at the end. And I think it's what you say; it sort of it breaks through that whatever's that surface area or something. I'm not sure. Well, it's it's uh, it removes some. I mean, I'm not saying it removes teacher authority, but it it humanizes the authority in the class. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I loved seeing, uh, I commuted to high school by ferry for the most, because I lived on an island off the coast of Maine. And I always enjoyed seeing some of my high school teachers boarding the ferry from other islands on, you know, one of the stops. And I'm like, oh, they got to commute too. That sounds like a uh, mutual misery. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like a tough one. Isn't it the island where they did the TV show from? Where they were looking for that buried treasure, aren't you? On that same spot? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, we've shot, there's a lot of stuff shot there. I don't know about that one. Oh, all right. yeah, They shot, um, on one of the neighboring islands, they shot the last movie with like, where like Betty Davis and all these old actors uh, from old, Hollywood kind of did their last movie together. It was called The Whales of August. Oh, really? And um, they they shot a movie on one of our neighboring islands there. And then there was a bunch of MTV stuff that was done out there with like, do you remember that show, The Real World? Sure. Where like, um, yeah. and they were towing. They had, they had these people water skiing behind a blimp, so the blimp was towing the water skiers, and it was one of their contests. And they did that off the coast of our island. I remember when that show first launched, the first real world, because, you know, TV was so scripted. And then this thing came along and it was kind of riveting. I don't know if I ever watched one after that, but the first one was. Yeah, I think this was uh, like one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. um, this was late 90s. Yeah. Um, and one of the islands, which nobody lives on, became like the losers had to all camp out on this island while the winners got to stay aboard a yacht. It's not so terrible. <laughs> it's horrible. And I remember we were, um, I was in high yeah. school at the time. And so my colleagues at the restaurant I was working at, we all decided to take a boat and go out to the island where well, we were trying to get to the yacht. Uh, and, and so we started, started out on the boat to see if they wanted to hang out with us. And, halfway out into the bay all these lights come on us and it turned out that they had gotten the u.s coast guard to provide security oh and we didn't have a running light and if you're operating a maritime vessel at night without a running light you're in a lot of trouble 
So they escorted us back to our island and um, oiled, li- lined us up on the dock, and they started taking names. And they eventually get to me. They're like, y- "You're Eric Norcross," and I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Is your dad Richard?" And I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "All right, you can go." <laughs> Because <laughs> my dad was a maritime captain that I guess was he, he's very from people in the maritime sector up there were very familiar with him. And mm. It was an interesting, weird MTV uh, Coast Guard experience. <laughs> yeah, the dad got you off the hook. Yeah, not just kind of like by name only. Um, but that's how I learned about running light laws. I don't know the treasure. The treasure thing that you were talking about, though, that's interesting. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, it's like there's some hole in the ground that they've been looking for treasure for years. I, somehow it's associated with you. Maybe it's somebody else. Do you want to see some images from the show that's up now? Yes, yes. And then I'll show you a film. I had that's... some questions about specific ones, so if they come up and I remember the questions, I'll ask you. Oh, that would be great. Questions make it easier, that's for sure. Yes, yeah. Um, all right, so I'll share this. For those of you listening on your commute, you'll just have to imagine. <laughs> now, let me see if I can. So what we have here is um, some organic neckties. <laughs> one looks yeah. like a sunset. The other one looks like a mudslide. And then. The, I, I, I'll jump off of that right there because that's a great, that's a great talking point, Eric, because. Thank you. A lot of this was about negotiating quarantine and the horror of it all. You read terrible news about folks and their families, and then the new the political landscape news. And then at the same time, I was out back in a sunny day gardening. You know, so I'm navigating these two worlds uh, from different ends. So the mudslide and the sunny day is really a great. Uh, description of this piece because that's kind of where that where it sits uh, trying to navigate you know enjoying your life but then reading about what's going on at the same time um, this one is the first one I did this is on 229 you can see the date on the on the side of it and this was for the first uh, victim in the United States fell to COVID in, in New York so um, February 29th 2020 yeah and you can see the one painted on there and it's funny that you say neckties because neckties find their way into a lot of these early paintings before i was doing these i was using um kind of a spillover from the potato head you know the little tie that came with the potato head set i started it's, importing them i found that with a lot of artists myself is definitely included is it is an interesting dynamic where we where it's a horrible year people are dying um worse than 9 11 in terms of deaths yet i find that artists are becoming become really very quite productive during all of this uh and you know it's, you're not the only one i've heard saying that it's it's a it's a talk about that that way where on one side the country's going through a lot of turmoil but at the same time you find yourself outside you know kind of gardening and doing all these enjoyable things uh for me personally like i produce some of the most meaningful writings i have in a long time because because i've had the time but at the same time you know i would trade up that productivity to not have people's loved ones dying and it's a i think that there there's a lot to be mined from this in in the days to come in the weeks to come in the months to come just in terms of like what it unpacking this it, it, it's so interesting uh to see it represented in this medium too is because you know obviously not the, the, the only artist i've had on here every art time i have an artist on here we talk about how about this dynamic the pandemic has resulted in a lot of freedom in a lot of ways but at the same time when you know why that freedom exists it's also terrifying and disheartening. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you were creatively productive. It's, it's you know, in, in no one would want to go through it again, but I wish I was more so. You know, I spend most, a lot of the time worrying and 
reading news and uh, I, yeah. And but I do know people who were more. One second, let me escape this. I mean, it's really easy to doom scroll, uh, and so I tried to <laughs> not do that. I was caught up in it too long. Hey, sure, I'm gonna close that door, okay? Oh, one second. Here. Sure. Okay. Sorry. Uh, doom scroll. I never heard that. Yeah, that's when you know, like when Trump wasn't signing the thing all weekend, and we're like, "What the fuck," you know? And so we're like, "Has he signed it? Has he signed it? Has he signed it?" Then everybody's provided commentary on why he hasn't signed it. Well, we know why because he's an asshole. And then he finally signed it, and then I'm not doom scrolling anymore. <laughs> so it's like, and that's been going on and off for like a year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this is how I sort of processed it. It would, it was, this is like a diary, let's say, this painting, a visual diary of 229. Not, the, not just my gardening, but reading the news, and uh, it comes out in the shape and color, hopefully. Yeah. So this is, just jumps way ahead. I guess I skipped a few, but June. you can see this is 617. And this painting has a few, you know, uh, stops on it, 63, 614, 617. So I just keep adding it to it every day and erase the total. You can see other numbers on there. And uh, the new total that day was 110, 123. And these come off the wall about four inches. It's a little shelf there. Yeah, so on the so for people listening, on the shelf, there's some structures. Uh, some of it looks organic. Some of it looks organic but artificial. And then below that, there's like a wall. Um, and then there's some more of those necktie type shapes, but then they're kind of evolving out of the necktie shape. Some one of the one up front has a little bit of tatteredness on the bottom, some sharp spikes. And there's a lot of yellow in this one, a lot of yellow and or uh, a little bit of pink in the brick. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's interesting the necktie because that that line of the shelf, I kind of see at the top of it as the this line between the conscious and the subconscious and, you know, the, the head and the body in a way. So the necktie sort of falls at that line of the show. Oh. Let's skip ahead to what's next. So here's July 9th, 7-9. We're at 1-2-2-2-9-4. 100,000, Now these, these titles, these totals are, you know, sort of organic they varied that day matter of fact when i would start painting i would recheck the total on the internet and by the time i finished that day that it had gone up another 600 or 400 i have to change the title and even in one day i was changing the numbers so you could see the remnants of the june in there that that yellow spiky thing that you pointed at yeah i also see the structure in the back on the top shelf there right Right, which has uh, lost some of its yellowness. The mood has changed a little in this one. Yeah, so this has evolved. Uh, you've added to it in terms of the the neckties. Uh, you got kind of a Christmassy one here on the left, and then you've got the um, sort of a blue arch now covering the structure at the top. Yeah, the Christmassy thing was uh, is a painted with um, my garden in mind. What are you What are you planting out there? Oh well, we have a lot of vegetables and salads and mustards that we live off of. Uh, live off of. Let's not Let's not go crazy. Let me Let me back up on that. Supplement. <laughs> Supplement. Uh, and carrots, tomatoes. But then we have a, a big array of flowers. There's like 52 beds in the back. These rock beds. Uh, it's It's fantastic. It's like Monet's Givenry. It's like my own garden out there. That I was, my intention was to paint it this summer. So in, in some ways I did. You know, it's just I was uh, just being more present in that, more aware of what was going on. Mm. Move ahead to this is uh, August 12th. It's getting more elaborate. The, the yeah, news. we've got some orbs in there now. Mm, yeah. Sun and sunset. There's like the that that thing on top there, maybe. Um, and then you could see some of the things from the potato heads that I was working on making their way in. I doubled the space in this one. 
so I continue to shelf. It's like twice the size as this one before. Uh, as I was adding new stories, I was thinking about the people involved. Um, I was thinking about the, the the day's events and my events during the day and how I was getting through that. You could see this one painted on eight two eight nine eight twelve. The dates that I worked on this on the side. Yeah, I love the depth. The the um, I think the orbs bring out some level of depth that I wasn't seeing before. Yeah, I should have taken a three-quarter view so you can kind of see. The shadows kind of let you see the depth a little bit. But. Yeah. And here is two days later. This is the same painting that is painted on uh, 814. So this is 166317, 166,317. And you can see that archway is sort of used in a different manner, kind of thrown off kilt. Yeah. It's almost like the ground coming up underneath to disrupt disrupt something that you thought was permanent, that you thought was stable. Mm. Yeah, well said. A lot of meaning. Okay, so uh, I forgot I was talking about the show right now. So this is, <laughs> I was just talking about these paintings, but the show, at the same time, I was doing what we started the show off with maybe these potato head things and seeing them different through the quarantine lens of uh, this, this prosthetic we have to put on our face every day, which is a mask. And I was making this series before that. Here's a, uh, a bunch of them together. I remember was, these from Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, you, I'm gonna put a link in the description, but y'all need to go to his Instagram account. Uh, it's pretty off the hook. So, you know, this is the idea of just seeing the faces, this sort of canvas and structure to work with. And again, it it all kind of started with teaching in a way. And like, what happens if we replace the eye with a larger eye? What happens if we place the eye with the nose? And what happens if we double the size of the ear? or change the eye color and ear color. And I really started growing really fast into these sculptural sort of paintings. I see them all as paintings, um, but you could, I guess, see them as sculptures. You could see them as photographs. Um, but then they, they led, here's, here's just one blown up. I don't know why this is, I must have adjusted the size on this one, but this one's kind of a sun. I see this as a sun. Maybe a, you know, like a seven, eight o'clock portrait, eight o'clock p.m. sun in summertime. But then they sort of led to this idea of scale and being able to hold these images. And I s switched up with uh, Topps trading cards <laughs> and turned them into a series of, I think because it relates back to the potato head and this sort of toy idea. And my probably the first art I ever collected in my life was probably baseball cards, um, which you can see exhibits of baseball cards at the Met Museum. They've had a few since I've been in New York. And here uh, it was sort of this dream come true of making my own baseball cards and kind of going back to that idea of where the potato head came from, this this sort of handheld art that I was used was first introduced to. So through Tops, I made my own series, and I made it, you know, there's 42 total. And they have front and back with descriptions on the back that vary from um, uh, philosophical things to poetic things to art instruction things to potato recipes, a number of those. Um, and they're all the same scale as you would see a, a baseball card. There's just one isolated. I think I have the back of one here coming up so are these are these official yeah they're made through tops oh so i could go and buy them right now you could uh they're selling them here at the at the gallery at the brownstone art gallery it's so right now as a set two sets and uh a drawing comes with it that's number 40 so here i that's the front, and then when you flip the card over, that's the back. And it says uh, for your 
commuting listeners, gestalt, something that is made of many parts and yet somehow more than or different from the combination of its parts, the generative quality or character of something. In a sentence, the gestalt of human consciousness. And, and then that was the front of it. I gotta look up if I spelled character wrong. How did how did we bury the lead? I think we should have opened with this. <laughs> this well, is amazing. Yeah, yeah, this is amazing. Well, I'm not gonna read it. I think that uh, I gotta find these. These are really cool. As I was thinking about um, kind of the different formats story can take and how you know that movie Mars Attacks was originally trading cards. Yeah, those the are the whole amazing. story played out across trading cards and Tops made those as well. Yeah. They also made a World War Two set that you should check out. They're incredible. They're really macabre. It's So did they come to you to do No, this? no, 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 no. <laughs> no. So what happened? Uh, I just contacted them, you know, you can make your own cards, people do them for little leagues and huh. things like that. And they really don't want any rights to do with it. You know, that you're kind of on your own with it. So I, I talked to the people there who were really nice about it, had them made. Um, here's, so I think I have one. Okay. Yeah. Here's a group of them. So there's like, I think there's 42 or 43 total, uh, um, and then the parts I ended up making into drawings. So you could see this when I flip it to the side. That was an earpiece at one point. And like Mr. Potato Head here, I switched it to a nose piece. And the, the colorful drawing parts in the drawing are actually potato prints. You know, people make as kids, they you can cut a potato in half and draw a design on it, make a print. And it kind of, uh, so I finally got to use my printmaking, my seven years of college printmaking skills, <laughs> again, with potato prints. Uh, and these are in frames. And if maybe you could see on the side, the, the plexiglass that houses them is sort of cut out so that the element can stick out. There's the nose that is featured on the first pack or, or the second pack. And then I use the string sort of as a drawing element, you know. And here's the second nose that is the cover of the second pack. And that's it from the side. So it also has this, it also blurs the line of is this 2D or a 3D sort of thing. I think you would benefit from one of those 3D uh, camcorders that they've now got on the market. What is it, Eric? It's like a, a 3D camcorder. It's like a regular camcorder, but uh, it shoots 3D video. So it's kind of rigged out in a way where you could document your work from huh. all sides. How much is that? Must be a lot of memory on those things. I don't know. I mean, you probably have to worry more about uh, your co current computer power before investing in one. But um, yeah, no, we'll find. We'll figure it out. Hey, when you sell that big painting, <laughs> find a sponsor. Them, <laughs> well, I'm, you know, it's, I'm, I'm thinking about your cards still because this is a great example of how you're thinking outside the box. You know, I've done a lot of those Thursday night gallery hopping around Chelsea. Uh, for those of you not in New York, Thursday night is usually the night that a lot of exhibits open in the Chelsea gallery scene. And I've never seen anybody use this, the trading cards as a way of as a medium for their work i mean the, the to think of that and to execute that well, you know i made some i guess in 2012 for ultraman uh i contacted tops then and i made my first cards with them but back then they they sent me to them they were laminated and I thought, who wants that? Like, I want what, not, nobody wants that. I want a baseball card like I held in my hand. Yeah. So I had a bunch made back then to do, um, you know, because I think Godzilla had a set of trading cards. You know, it just was a natural fit, really. It wasn't about, like, this is or isn't art. It was just like, I'm trying to always turn over every stone I can. 
until I exhaust a project and then I get it out of my system, I can move on. Yeah. So with Ultraman, I, I still might go back and make another set. Are you selling them as the complete set? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a complete set. And then this is the last image in the gallery that I have up here now, which is a lot of the pieces that were in the, you know, there's eyes, there's ears, there's mouse, um, and then the strings that could be used on, uh, let me see if I go back, if you could see. Let me go back to, he to here. Um, maybe these, see those glasses, those eyes? The yeah. giant. I think if you go forward, this is the last image. They're hanging right central. Um, so the kind of idea here was after you go through the show, you, you're at the beginning of the show. You're sort of handed a mask, a virtual mask, which is an eye or an ear. In this case, there are two noses. And at the end, this is sort of everybody coming through the show and hanging there. Their N95 mask as they exit the place. Um, so this is the last thing you see in the, in the <laughs> current show that's up right now. It's a wall piece, you know, done with thumbtacks and elastic string. When I was at an art store and they had, I, I was just using string to tie these on, and the guy at the art store over there on Metropolitan Avenue said, I oh, know we have gummy string where you can use to make your own masks. Oh, my God, I was so excited. <laughs> um, it's the exact same thing you would, you know, buy in a Halloween store, I guess. When you're when you're out obtaining supplies for your projects, are right, do you most for the most part know what you're going to the store for, or are you usually more open minded about what they have? Like, I kind of I'm kind of usually going to the store for something, but like a child, I could be distracted easily. And be like, oh wow, googly eyes. Yeah, I need googly <laughs> eyes. I always, I always need Google eyes. It's a necessity. Um, in fact, they show up. They show up in in this show as well. One of the drawings has a bunch of googly eyes that I just happened to come across when I was out at the art store looking for something else. Um, let me see if I can get it up for you here. Well, it's interesting because I don't know how. Like when I download the Zoom. It edits based on who's talking, so I don't know what it's going to show us. It's it's really interesting to see. It'll be interesting to, to see how the share screen will appear. Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't know how it'll look, but it'll be interesting for sure. So you might not be able to see any of this at all. <laughs> In which case, I would just uh, have you send me everything. <laughs> there, can you see that? Hopefully, that it's recording it. Yes, it's, so it's the... The, the face with the the blue thing coming out of the eye? Yeah, under that is a bunch of pink googly eyes that I found when I was looking for something else at the eye <laughs> store. Uh, it just really went nice with the under the eye image and with the potato print that was beside it. And that so, earpiece was one that I used for, you know, one of the prosthetics. So when, the when you saw the googly eyes at the art store, <laughs> is this immediately what you thought you would do with it? Or is it? Um, no, I thought I need those. You just need those, and you didn't know yeah, what you were going to like, do. Like, who doesn't? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that show is uh, – and then I have a, a little film midway through the show that sort of tells you how to put a mask on. You want to see that, Eric, since we're exhausting all this? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we want to sell the show, right? Oh, well, this is just a touch of it. And the cards, I can't show all of them. I only showed you a few. There are, there's like 40-some cards with front and yeah. back. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share this video, which this comes about midway through the show before you see the, uh, the trading cards. Inspect the mask for tears or holds. Do not use a mask that has previously been worn or is damaged. Verify which side is the top. This is usually where the metal strip is. Identify the inside of the mask, which is usually the white side. Place the mask on your face, covering your nose, mouth, and chin, making sure there are no gaps between the mask. Pinch the metal strip so that it molds to the shape of your nose. Remember, do not touch the front of the mask while using it to avoid contamination. 
If you accidentally touch it, clean your hands. <laughs> I don't know if that yeah, mask is public safety message. <laughs> Far out, man. Um, and then you could, you could, I'm, I'm, and maybe I beat on the cards for a while, but I'll show you this and you could edit out if you want, because I just wanted to share this with you so you can understand the scale of it. So that's the two packs, and you can see that's the red nose that was in the frame. Uh, and they're addition to 40, so I only made 40 additions of them. And in each pack comes two small potato prints. Uh, handmade prints that you could frame. And then these tops are archival prints as well. So they won't sort of fade. And then here is sort of a grouping of the cards. And then just so you can sort of, sort of see the scale of them, it's the same size as a, uh, um, do I have one in here of the, of the prints that come with it? I should too. Do you want to see this stuff, Eric? Or have I yes, I do, because I want them, and I want to promote them. Okay. I, I, I think this is such a wonderful way to just distribute art somehow. Let me it's so one. inventive. Okay, so on the bottom there are two. Each pack comes with its own potato print that sort of you could frame together or just keep them in the packs. Uh, and there's two colored print from an organic purple potato. And then each com pack comes with a uh, gum painting or gum sculpture. That is, you could see on the left. I don't know if you remember when you bought baseball cards, trading cards, it came with gum. So I see one of them as a sculpture and one of them as a drawing. And then the packs where each pack was curated by two different people. Will Corin uh, curated pack A and Lisa Carezzi curated pack B. And that in a sense means the order that they, that you can go through the pack as you open them. And then uh, also how they sort of saw it as artists and writers themselves when they went through it. I started seeing them as a mini gallery, right? And I thought, oh, th these little galleries should have their own curators as well. So each, each each pack is also curated. That's great. I didn't even know this was going to go this way. This is fantastic, and I'm very inspired now. Now I'm thinking, like, oh, that's a medium all its own. What can it? What what else can be done with it? I, so I wasn't I thinking about need before. To, I need to surprise you, Eric. To put well, that's me. that's what you're good at. You're really good at like opening my brain up in ways that I wouldn't have thought. Um, before we figure out how to wind this down, I want to show you something. Right. I want to see if you remember making this for me. Remember that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. So this this is one of two pieces of art I have hung in my apartment. Uh, I love it when people give me art. And yeah, uh, I have them on the wall along with three uh, encapsulated comic books. <laughs> Nice. That was a, a series I made for the Ultraman show that we didn't, um, I don't think we had room for it. Like sometimes I make art so much that I just don't, I don't know what to do with it all. I usually, but I, I appreciated you curating me into that show and the time we spent together. So I do remember giving that to you. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And, um, that's the when we moved into this apartment. That was the first thing I hung up. Fantastic. Um, anyway, I think I think we got a good amount of time in here for me to figure out what to do with this. I, I I'm going to try to get it up on Friday so people have time to go visit your current online show. Um, so. You're selling your tops trading cards where? At uh, the it's the Brownstone Gallery. I think their website is uh, their website is the brownstoneart.com. Okay. And you could also visit the show there. It's sort of it's sort of laid out. They did a great job laying it out as as if you were walking through the space. Yeah. Yeah, I stepped through that quite a few times uh, over the weekend to try and get a sense of the show 
Um, and so I'll put a link in the description for that. And I'll also put a link to your website, which is, I think it's Mike Raider Studio. It is, yeah. And uh, do you want links to your social, your Instagram and all that? Yeah, that's fine. All right, cool, cool. And so, because you have a really good Instagram and you should have more followers. I, um, I don't I don't keep on it. I don't post as much as I think they they recommend. Yeah, I well, I can't even post on it right now because I'm still waiting for my new phone, but... um. I well, think I that you're you're using Instagram the way I think it should be used. Uh, I mean, as, for an artist, it's like the perfect one, the perfect of all the social media platforms. Yeah, uh, my it. phone is, I don't know what happened. I just couldn't install programs. The ones that I had stopped working. So I, I paid it off very quickly using last year's stimulus and, uh, that way I could upgrade it. And so I put in for an upgrade many, many months ago. Uh, what kind of and, phone is it? Well, I'm upgrading from a Galaxy S9 to the Apple 12 Pro. All right. So I'm actually changing. As I've been a, I've been on the Samsung Galaxy for about a half a decade now. and That's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. I'm done with, with Galaxy. Mm. Well, you know what happened was I interviewed at Samsung's U.S. headquarters in New Jersey to do video for them, ah. and they ghosted me. And so I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to upgrade to another Samsung after this. Good for you. Yeah, so now I'm at Apple. I mean, I'm sure Apple would ghost me too, but they haven't, so. <laughs> when they <laughs> so ghost you, then you can switch. Hopefully. Then I could switch to somebody else, yeah. <laughs> well, good uh, luck, because switching platforms is probably a pain in the ass. It is. Uh, it's going to be what consumes my evening, actually. Yeah. Because it's supposed to come today. So I'll be back on Instagram this week, no doubt. All right. I look forward to seeing you there. You sort of disappeared. Yeah. And I know Sorry you sent me that, that note when I, when I saw it. I was like, oh, my gosh. That was – I think maybe I didn't respond to you because you just disappeared off of that. Maybe yeah, I couldn't respond I don't know. I don't know what happened. Um, I just responded to your response through the web oh. browser. But, um, yeah, I'll let you know when I'm back. I'll post something. Hey, let me take a screenshot of us here together. Sure. I wish I had one with the, the cat in it. But... Let me see. Oh, that's good. You got it? Yeah, I'm going to post this up later. Yeah, and this will go live Friday. I, I'll edit it down. I'll... Uh... I'll, try to, I'll try to find a natural way of so that you can listen to it and not feel like we're <laughs> you're going to the restroom <laughs> halfway through. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I saw uh, that interview that we did together. We hung out for an hour and you, you nailed like the most uh, essential three minutes of it. It was impressive. Yeah. This, this medium's definitely not like that though. This yeah. is more just an hour and whatever conversation. And it's supposed to like, my idea is just to kind of have it as natural as possible. Um, this one was different because we had a slideshow, which will be very interesting and very fun and very different. And I think that's that's indicative of the guests, right? So I would expect you to come with something I don't expect, <laughs> uh, I guess, if that yeah. makes any kind of sense. I, I, I loaded things up because I didn't want you to ask to show images, and then we sit here for 25 minutes while I dig them out. Well, what I would have done in that case, because you're, you know, the conversation really requires some level of visual reference because it's hard to describe some some of the some of the work and so i would have probably just used still grabs from the website or whatever but now i'm glad that you had them prepared well hopefully when uh we get vaccinated and i have my three stooges set up you you can drop over to brooklyn yeah, and we could do like could, another. Um, I already maybe have. We could the, do like an on-location one where we're in your studio. Oh, that'd be fun! I already have the 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 costumes made up for Mo, Larry, and Curly. Um, I think I sent you one of those before, didn't I? The, I vaguely remember seeing something like that. Um, long time ago. I've been trying to launch it for a while and start it, but uh, and I, I, honest, and the one character Curly is going to start, which is why I said it brings me around to your film. As he's adding this knowledge, if you want to call it, he's starting to mutate and grow into this big, blobby sculptural shape. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how we 
both handle a similar idea, I guess. Yeah. Do like a compare and contrast. I also still have to send you Death in Life. I don't know if I've sent that to you because you yeah, created not. the main prop of that uh, for it's something not, else. Is it, is it online? Uh, it was Amazon pulled it because they just they decided they sent me a note saying that uh, we've determined that our audience isn't enjoying your film and therefore oh, we're yeah, it really fucked up. Um, I've oh, talked about yeah. it extensively on this thing already, but <laughs> they've been <laughs> yeah. I guess it's just too artsy, too slow. Um, but I love it. I think it's one of my favorite things I've done, and the the main piece that he uses to communicate with people you initially created to be a submersible for another movie. So it's interesting how like I wasn't able to really finish that movie. So I just kind of readapted it for something else. I'm sorry. Amazon said that considered a badge of honor. (laughs) I do. I, uh, I actually have it in the review section of my website. So (laughs) yeah, I'll send, I'll see about sending you a link so you can watch that. Yeah, please do. All right. Uh, I'll be in touch by email. Thanks, man. All right. Good to see you, Eric. All right. Bye. Take care of yourself. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining the podcast. Uh, that was my discussion with Mike Rader, uh, an artist I met back in 2012. I love his work. He's always opening my mind up to the possibilities, to new mediums, to new ways, just kind of getting work out there. Uh, really, He's really an outside-the-box thinker that inspires me on a multitude of levels. And I wanted to introduce him to all of you through the podcast because I, I assume many of you are creative or interested in being creatives. And uh, of course, I want to share the, the people that inspired me. And Mike is definitely one of them. And I hope you enjoyed this discussion and you found it productive and uh, a, a class in outside the box thinking that's that's how i would look at it it's a class in outside the box thinking and i'll see you all on the next episode thank you very much hold on eric we can edit this out right yeah sure <laughs> or you can leave it i don't know it makes for excellent listening on the commute the commute me clicking around <laughs>